I think that will be all set. Okay, so uh, we'll call the meeting to order at whatever time it is, 702. Um, and does anyone have any announcements before we go to the minutes? Um, I have a couple of things that I would just note, which is there's uh, CHAPA has its annual regional meeting in September 22nd. And so I think people got a link, but that's a good thing if people want to go to. And I just heard the other day that there is a new, there's a permanently permanent supportive housing development at 5 Franklin Street in Northampton that is just opening up very soon. And there's an open house on Tuesday, August 2nd from five to seven that we are invited to anybody who wants to go. It sounds like a really cool project. So those are the announcements that I have besides the fact that the legislative session is ending kind of any minute. And uh, we sent out a number of things that people could try to do to influence the legislature to do some of the things that we wanted to the mo one of them at least being passed the enabling legislation so that if Amherst chose to, we could have a tax on high end real estate sales as a way to fund the, the trust, which funding the trust is always seems like a, um, a big issue. So that's what I've got. Anybody else? Can I just ask that you write the open house details in the chat or? Is there a chat in this thing? No, you know, I was, we had a chat function. We had started it for forums and I was told not to have the chat okay. function um, for the possibility that it could, you know, violate open meeting law. So we can talk about that. Oh dear, okay. <laughs> we can can you hold a piece of paper up? With it could be just an email. Could you could you just put it in an email, perhaps into the it's, or at all? Is that the end? Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think an invitation to do something violates open meeting law. No, but the, awesome. I can't enable the chat right now, so it's something that has to be. You know, I just can't. We can't. I can't enable it mid meeting. I have to go in and change it, and then. Um, I don't have. I'm not prepared to because I don't I have it I don't have it electronically in front of me anyway so it would be hard for me to do it right now but the you can two share things that. that I just said but you can share um, that um by email Carol so you know whatever yeah I'll I'll about. do that I will after the meeting I will e I will email it and yeah okay thank you thank you so you know I have an announcement it's not nothing um that's you know too imminent, but I know that um, some town council members, maybe the community resource committee, it's a subcommittee of the council, is discussing changing zoning for you know two families and um, different residential uses in town. And so, you know, as part of the discussion tonight, we're looking at trust actions. So we can talk about it a little bit more. But it is you know there is interest, and in any anyhow, the announcement would be that there's interest on the council, you know, and the planning board to see you know, what kind of zoning regulations or changes could be made to help with, um, you know, to help with housing development. So, uh, you know, it, I think as the trust, we, you know, the trust can be an advocate or recommend certain changes. So it's something that I can try to bring back to you as an agenda item or, you know, if a member or two wants to look into it more together, we can. So anyways, that's just, you know, I don't, I don't want to forget that. Yes, please. I, I, I at least would like to know whenever somebody knows that there are changes being thought about so that we can join in the thinking about them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Allegra? Yes, question to kind of that extent. I feel like this, I think it's the Community Resources Committee is um, doing the rental bylaw retooling or rethinking. And I don't know how much if any idea building this body should have in that process or if if that's reasonable for us to have some stake or interest in but i just i noticed that there was a bunch of 
meetings coming up with various stakeholders and I did not see us as one of them and I was not sure if we should be or not. But. It's a good question. I don't, I don't, Nate, do you have an opinion and answer anything? Yeah, I mean, I know some councils were interested in it, you know, because other communities and different states have, um, you know, kind of a different rental registration with student housing. And so uh, in the building commissioner and inspectors that always thought that what was on the books could be modified, you know, at some future time. So it's kind of, it is that now that future date rental registration has been in place for a few years. So I don't, you know, I don't necessarily have an opinion either way. I guess, you know, the trust could have it, at, you know, in the next month or two as an agenda topic and it could, we could invite someone to come and, you know, describe it. Um, you know, I think what they're looking at doing is making it a little more thorough in terms of uh, checklists and providing information and then maybe having more enforcement mechanisms or options for resolutions with property owners. You know, I, I, to, to be honest, I don't know the details, but it sounds like that's where they want to go with it, right? To make it a little bit more um, thorough. And so, you know, right now it's really just a self-reporting, um, you know, process. And I'm, I'm not sure how that will change if they're looking at doing it some other way, but, you know, it's like 1200 property owners, whatever, every year complete the forms and submit the information to the town. And so it's working and that maybe there's ways to make it a little stronger, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where they're going with it. So I'm not people, sure the trust, you know, what the trust opinion would be. So it's something we could talk about. Is that something people are interested in talking about? We can just do a sort of a straw poll thing, I think, about this. But is that something people are interested in? Or if it's bigger than a straw poll, somebody please speak, say something. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't feel like I really understand like zoning. I mean, I it would be great to hear from someone that even just basically explains it. I mean, I would like to be more informed, for sure. Similarly, I would like to have some background information on what it exists now, just so we're coming in informed, because <laughs> uh, I am not either. Well, yeah, okay. So if we ask someone to come, we would ask them to get us up to speed and give us a bit of an understanding of what's being proposed. Presumably then the materials that would come with that meeting would be something about what is being proposed so we could look at it also and not have to just rely on what we heard in the moment. Right. <clears throat> so I, I think what I'm hearing is that that can be kind of on a, on a stack of things that we like to do at some future time. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Can we move on then to the first thing, which is just to review the minutes from the June meeting? I believe they went out with the stuff that Nate sent. So um, does anybody have any comments, questions, concerns? Do they look OK? I think that what we've done in the past is just uh, if there aren't any concerns, we don't really, we just sort of accept them. We accept these minutes. And I don't know, I don't think we have to do that with a formal vote, but I'm assuming if I don't hear anybody, anything that says no, that that's a yes. That's probably the wrong way to do it, but I'm trying that for the moment. <laughs> that's something I wanted to say to start with. Please, if anybody has any suggestions or, or if it feels like we're doing something that it's difficult or isn't working right, please let us know. Erica and I are trying to figure this out as we go along. So we're very open to uh, whatever you have to say about what we're doing. So no, I, mean, I think thanks. the minutes were, you know, I, usually when we have volunteers, I'll say, you know, keep the minutes to a few pages. Um, you know, sometimes for planning board, you know, they're like 12 pages, single space and it's somewhat nice but then it's also really a transcript of the meeting and with zoom now with it, it being recorded if we really need to we have a transcript of the meeting um it's not you know it's maybe like 90 percent accurate or 80 percent you know it's not as good as the minutes but you know if someone really wants to know exactly what was said at some time there's a video recording that's online and there's a transcript associated with it so i i feel like they're you know um you know minutes really need to have who's present who's absent uh, materials that were submitted reviewed and then a summary of the discussion points. So, you know, pick up. Yeah, and a, yeah. and a record of any decisions that were made. Yeah. yeah, okay. Well then I we accept the minutes and we can move on to 
Nate, who is going to tell us about our financial situation. Yeah, the trust is looking great. <laughs> now, I'll share my screen. The um, the uh, <clears throat> so you know that most of the trust funding comes from CPA, you know, Community Preservation Act funds, and so even though the trust can uh, bankroll those uh, that money, and it's one of the, it's only the it's one of the few organizations that can. So usually when you when um, CPA funds are allocated, it has to be to a specific project, but in the le state legislation and the state law, it actually says housing trusts can just accumulate CPA money for development funds or for however it can be used, but it still has to follow CPA guidelines. So CPA has guidelines in terms of income eligibility and percent of affordability and other things. So the first line is unrestricted account. Uh, so non-CPA funds. So the trust does have some money that's not from CPA. So that can be gifts or donations. Um, Interfaith Housing uh, did give the trust, um, I think it was 20,000 a few years ago. And then there were some previous funds in a housing uh, account, gift account for the town. So um, what the columns show are, you know, anything that's in contract uh, and then what's available. So in this unrestricted account, we have 30, almost 36,000. And so what we pay out of that is, um, you know, right now we pay like $200 a month for uh, the maintenance of Belchertown Road and East Street School properties. You know, there's a small maintenance fee. And honestly, that's about it. Um, so there's not a lot of expenses on that account. Uh, CPA restricted, those are earnings. So the housing trust is, uh, you know, a trust fund actually, and the town manages it. And the, the funding of the trust gets invested through, um, you know, a different way than say general funds of the town. So the town might have a half dozen or more trust funds. And so it actually earns interest. So that interest right there is over the last 10 years, there's been $63,000 in interest in earnings on the trust funds. Um, so there's that amount of money. Um, technical services, this is uh, the contract. Uh, I don't know if this is actually, um, this is, no, I was gonna say this might be Rita's contract, but it's not. So the, the trust at one point had allocated or received $20,000 for technical services. So, um, you know, this is like if we hire a wetland scientist to assess a property or a surveyor to do a survey or, you know, even an attorney to do some deed research or something. So there's $3,000 under contract there and that's to um, study the Strong Street properties for housing. There's, so there's 3,000, almost 3,100 in contracts, and then there's 17,000 available. Why uh, do the numbers, I'm, I'm seeing different numbers. Technical well, service has 3,000 and the available balance is 60. So I'm, I'm just rounding it to 3,100. So okay, okay, about, okay, got it. About Thank 3,100. You. All right. Thank you. I can make it bigger if that helps. Um, Thank you. <laughs> that does <clears throat> yeah, it's hard to, hard to Yeah, hard to say what's visible. Um, and then consulting services, we have um, another line for consulting services. So, you know, for instance, Rita is under contract uh, and there's eight, 8,900 left or so in her contract. And then there's $18,000 left to hire a, another consultant. And so, I mean, this is pretty similar to technical services. Um, you know, consulting services, it could be that we hire someone again that stays, um, you know, we hire someone for a year and they're available as needed or like a technical service, we could hire someone for a specific task. Um, so that money is available for that. And then development funds are typically every year the trust asks for, um, you know, two, 300,000, 400,000, maybe half a million. Uh, John's in the audience, he'll laugh. He, we usually push for half a million from CPA and they award us two or 300,000. And so we have 216,000 available and we have 177,000 um, in contracts. And so 100,000 of that is the money that we awarded to Valley CDC. We have $100,000 for the Northampton Road project, East Gables. And then 77,000 is um, encumbered on various things. So um, uh, some of it is when we purchased the East Street School, the town purchased the East Street School and Belchotown Road properties the trust said we'd put in a certain amount of money and some of that money is still encumbered for that purpose in case we need to do other due diligence on the property. Um, 
And then some of the money is still encumbered, I think, for some rental assistance. Um, so, you know, some of it might be able to be liquidated, but for now, it's we're, we're going to keep it. We, we have it encumbered. So, you know, all told, the trust has about 190,000 in contracts and 350,000 that's available. That, that really is just, um, you know, could be put in, put under contract without any, without really any restrictions. So the whole, the, those, the numbers are additive, not, it's not like of the 216, 177 is restricted, is encumbered. It's that there is the 177 that's encumbered plus in addition, there's the 216. Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're separate, they're separate amounts. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So this is, you know, I, I generated this and it's easier than at one point I shared probably like a year ago, a, a general ledger report and Carol and I went through it and it, it has a lot more columns and different numbers, but I think this is probably the simplest distillation of this, the, the, the this money. is so much better than that, Nate, you tried to walk me through the other thing one time, and this is much more understandable. So, you so know, thank the, you very much. Yeah. So the accounts here, I mean, the town rarely adds account lines. So um, for instance, like development funds, we put more money in there if we got CPA money and money for consulting services would just be added to that consulting services line. And so unless there's like a whole nother kind of budget line where money could be put into, um, like for instance, say the trust was a property owner or we're taking in rental income, we might have a line item here like rental um, funds or something, rental income. But for now, you know, if we get money, it will probably go into one of those account lines. It's great. That's great. And at some point, so now has everything cleared out of here that was involved in our rental assistance project? Yeah. So yeah, there, I guess I think there's still, a little, there's still a little bit encumbered in the 177 for the rental. Okay. Um, I think we can probably liquidate that. And I think I'm not sure if the trust funds that were approved just this past spring from CPA are added in the development funds. Um, cause you know, what, what happens is the, the town, uh, CPA funds are approved and they stay within the CPA accounts. And then at some point accounting moves them over into trust funds. And I'm not sure if that's happened yet, uh, or if it's included in this balance. Um, so, but. Okay. Well, that's, that's very helpful. And I hope we, uh, uh, Erica and I asked Nate, if he could do this for us kind of quarterly, let us know where we are and hopefully also show us like if something's different next time, what happened, what went out, what came in. And certainly next time the 177 will lose the $100,000 that I know that um, Valley has just asked for, for the, for the Northampton road project. Anyways, that's great. Thank you so much, Nate. Does anybody yeah. have any questions or anything at this point? Well, you did ask the question about the emergency rental. Um, so I don't think Ashley or Risha were here when we uh, voted on providing emergency rental assistance um, to help uh, individuals and families around COVID um, to mitigate you know, the, the negative impact of COVID possibly on job loss or being able to pay the rent. Um, I'm wondering about FEMA. Uh, did we ever get any funds back in terms of what we put out and getting monies back from that? Yeah, so we, we did. I don't, I don't have an exact accounting of that. So, um, you know, we had allocated, I think it ended up being like 250,000 for emergency rental assistance. And I think the trust may have actually only spent about 70,000. And so, um, you know, COVID funding supported a lot of that. Um, because it was eligible. So, you know, if we had spent our full, you know, all that money, you know, our available balance right now might be, you know, 200,000 or 250 as opposed to three, 350,000. So yeah, it was a benefit. So what we ended up doing was, um, you know, paying it and then requesting almost like simultaneous reimbursement. So the, you know, it was, the money was never, it's not like we were, the trust was ever down a lot. It was like, we would pay it and then request reimbursement pretty, pretty frequently after. And the money would just come back into the trust. So, but we did um, get reimbursed on that. Thank you. And we don't pay for the administrative costs that um, you, for you to do all this work with. So thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> and so, 
Sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so just wondering, A, what are the, the goals of like on the CPA funding? Do they have requirements that we spend it within a certain amount of time or is it sort of however long it takes us? Uh, and then also, yeah, how does this compare to any other point in time? Is it? Yeah, I mean, I think the trust has been solely capitalizing and, you know, accruing funds. So this is, you know, probably, you know, every year the trust is awarded CPA funds and, they're, you know, makes, you know, interest earnings. So this is probably the most money it's had. Um, so like I said, the CPA committee really does like to see project specific allocations, but the housing trust doesn't need that. So, you know, in the development funds line, for instance, if, if we asked for a half a million this year and they gave it to us, it would just add to the running balance of the trust. Um, you know, uh, because there's also requests specific to a project, right? So in the last year, Valley CDC asked for funding for their project and, you know, um, different, you know, the housing authority asked for money and Amherst Community Connections or other organizations asked for money. So the CPA still, you know, um, recommends and then town council votes on funding for a specific project. So the trust could do that too. You know, the trust could say, well, we want $200,000 for Belchertown Road, and we also want $200,000 just for general development funds. Um, you know, and so part of the, you know, what we discussed later in the action plan, I mean, trusts are always looking across the state ways to, to fund itself, right? So we have some other mechanisms, but usually CPA money is um, the biggest uh, piece. And so, you know, I think our CPA committee has been generous, but, you know, some committees or some towns the CPA can allocate a certain percent every year to housing. And sometimes they just say that whole percent goes right to the trust, right? They don't also give it to other projects. And so um, that's different in Amherst. Any other questions? And I'm gonna pass it over to Erica, who's gonna talk about open meeting. Thank you. you. Um, and there were lots of leads lead-ins um, in our conversation already, such as um, the need for minutes uh, and transparency. So thank you. Um, I think it's sometimes difficult to transition from you know, being part of a coalition or other types of meetings and being a public body. And so I think this is really a good opportunity for all of us to uh, one, think about this uh, as a public body and think about what our responsibilities are. And so thank you, Nate, for one, sending out the slides and also um, the regulations, uh, which I've both taken a look at. But with 52 slides, we decided we're just going to do highlights. And I think what's more important is to open it up to ask um, for everyone to ask questions so we can ensure that we're uh, in compliance with the open meeting law. Um, so um, you can find the open meeting law guide in educational materials, along with what Nate submitted to us on the Attorney General's Office uh, website. And the Attorney General Office is um, the office that ensures compliance and also monitors compliance. Um, and um, the reason for the open meeting law is really to ensure that there's transparency in any deliberation uh, which public policy is based on. And that's on page four of the open meeting law, as well as in the slide set. I think the slide set actually provides a really great overview um, of the, um, the most important aspects of the open meeting law. Um, but I think that what's really important is that um, we think about you know, how we support transparency, uh, uh, in terms of the public and, and what it is that we're doing. So um, the trust is the public body and subject to the open meeting law. So one of the first things that have to happen is, is that we have to have a notice um, of the meeting um, and it must be posted 48 hours in advance uh, unless there's an emergency, but generally it, it gives an opportunity for the public who would like to attend um, to be able to attend. Um, the fact that we do a recording and that we also have minutes is also opportunities to record what happens uh, and for the public to also uh, review what has happened if they can't make the, the meeting but would like to make the meeting. Um, each of us has received the open meeting law materials as part of our orientation. We actually have to be certified. We have to have a certification that we have gotten the information and that we have read it and, and we understand it and we will comply with it. Uh, and that again, that's the responsibility of being a member of a public um, a body. Um, deliberation, which I think is probably sometimes the most confusing for me at least, um, what is deliberation? And that's any oral or written communication through any medium, including electronic mail, 
between or among a quorum. So Ashley, you asked what the quorum was. Um, and Nate, you said we're a body of nine. And so a quorum would be five. Um, but I think also it's really important. Um, uh, so I'll read that again. Deliberation is an oral or written communication through any medium, including electronic mail, between or among a quorum of public body, simple majority, on any public business within its jurisdiction. And that's again, page six of the open meeting law. Um, but the slides are really good in um, showing what is a public body and um, also defines one deliberation and two um, what the public body is, as well as different aspects of deliberation. Uh, one of the things that is clearly, um, you know, sort of noted is that um, the expression of an opinion on matters within the body's jurisdiction to a quorum of public body is deliberation even if no other public body member responds. And I think that's important because sometimes I, I was sort of under the misconception of that we have to have a dialogue back and forth. And sometimes what happens is, is um, we may, you know, have a, um, you know, an email that goes out and um, I know I've done this, you know, John sends a wonderful email out and I'm like, oh, this is great. This is my opinion. Um, and it's like, okay, that violates the open meeting law. Um, we're not supposed to deliberate on email because the public is not on the email and they cannot hear um, the deliberation. So um, if somebody sends something out, um, if we want it as a topic on the agenda, um, great topic, I have lots of questions, can we have it on the agenda? Um, we could put it on the, Carol and I could put it on the agenda for a meeting and then we can, we can have a discussion here, we can deliberate here, share ideas, um, share our comments. So I think that's, that's really important because it helped me to think, I, I've always thought just, well, you know, if something goes out and, you know, I just share my opinion with, you know, at least, you know, a couple of people that that's fine. It's not. Um, so we have to really think about it. So, you know, part of with regard to the um, open meeting law um, is what does it really mean for us? Um, we can send each other information, announcement, alerts, resources, or agenda items, but we cannot include any opinion or discuss discussion regarding them. Um, we can state, please um, have this be part of our agenda, but um, no deliberation, no comments, no opinions, because that would then violate the open meeting law. And so how I keep on thinking about it is, does the public have the ability to see, hear, read, what it is that I, as a trust member, is putting out, um, and if they don't, then it, uh, if we if we are sending it to each other, it could violate the open meeting law. And of course, there are exceptions. And again, the slides are really great um, in uh, presenting what the exceptions are. You know, one of the exceptions in exec is an executive session. Um, generally, my experience here has been on the trust that we post that as well as the agenda. We may have an open meeting. And then um, due to the fact that we might be talking about buying a property um, or thinking about uh, acquiring a property, which could then um, you know, give somebody advantages, um, we can go into an executive session. And under the open meeting law, that is, we have the ability to do that. Um, so we go into an executive session and we would be allowed to just uh, be part um, of a closed meeting without the public. But minutes have to be detailed with regards to um, who participated, what was discussed, or what decisions were made um, with regard to the, um, the executive session, uh, again, to comply with the open meeting law. Um, and so what that also underscores is that is we always need a minute taker. So thank you, George, for today being um, the minute taker and, and you know, volunteering to be our minute minute taker, but there'll be times that George may not be available. Uh, for example, he's not going to be available in the August meeting, so we will need a volunteer. So minutes are really, really important to be in compliance with the open meeting law, um, just to make sure that everybody, as Nate says, we yes, we have the recording, yes, we have a transcript, but I think it's also important to have documentation, especially for possible new members who may not have been at prior meetings and want to see an account of what took place or how the decision was made or what was being focused on, it's always important to have documentation. So um, we will always ask for a volunteer beforehand um, if someone is not available, if George is not available to take minutes. Um, so I want to open up for any questions that you may have. I know all of you have received the slides and the um, open meeting law guide and educational materials, but um, I think it's often helpful. Um, I was new to the trust a few years ago, and I constantly had to go back and forth and either ask somebody or look at you know the materials just to make sure um, I understood what my responsibility was. So let me just open it up if there are any questions. Yeah, sorry, I just, I just sorry, I just want to say quickly that the conversation 
um, over emails and everything get a little tricky. So the um, a serial conversation where, for instance, one member emails one member and then that other, they email a second member or a third member. And then, you know, before you know, it goes through four or five members, but those five members haven't talked directly, but it's been, you know, one to one to one. That is still considered a conversation or could be a violation of open meeting law. And so, you know, I don't think it happens intentionally. I think most of the time it's unintentional. Um, and so, you know, I just want everyone to be aware that, you know, even something like that is an issue. And so, you know, if there's a, an and if there's a meeting that's not a trust meeting, say there's a, um, a select board meet or a, a town council meeting, if there was a select board meeting in another town, we think a, a quorum of the trust is gonna go there and talk about something that the trust would then maybe talk about or have jurisdiction over, we could post it as a trust meeting, even though it's really not, you know, like a regularly scheduled meeting. So if the community resource committee is having a discussion on housing and the trust is like, oh, I'd like to go, we could just post it as a trust meeting as well. So that way if trust members speak at it, you know, we're not in violation of, of open meeting law. And so, um, you know, I, that's one way. And the other way is just to be careful of email. So I think it's fine. For instance, if someone emails an article and says, I think this is a good article, you know, and if, every, if people have comments or questions about it, you can always send it to, to me or to the co-chairs, then we can send the questions back out to the whole trust and we will just say, don't respond to all. And let's just, you know, here are questions that are being asked. This will be on the next uh, agenda, but it's okay if you see an article about housing or something that's really good. Or if you have, um, you know, you see an event or something, you know, th that's fine to email to the group. Um, that's a, yeah, yeah, so a kind of rule of thumb that we've thought of is unless you have some really good reason why not just, email anything to some combination or of Nate and Erica and I, and we'll do something to get it to be looked at in a way that is appropriate, which probably means on a upcoming agenda. Yeah, I think, um, again, the slides are really good. So things like an agenda or scheduling reports or documents, those are not considered deliberation. Um, even, you know, a meeting of sub quorum, as long as it's not a subcommittee, one of our subcommittees. But I think what Nate said about going um, to an event together, like maybe going to a training, maybe going to a conference. Um, my understanding of the open meeting laws is we can do all of that and, and we can be there but we can't talk about it if it has to do with our jurisdiction. So if we all go to a conference on affordable housing and there are five of us who are there and start talking about, oh, I think this should be part of our policy or you know, that would be considered a violation of the open meeting law. We can bring it back and say, oh, we learned a lot of excellent things, some best practices, let's put it on the agenda and we'll send you know, the information to Carol, Erica to put on the agenda. Um, so yeah. Any other questions? Anything that's well, not clear? I'm just curious, do we have any at the moment subcommittees or that was, I saw that on the agenda, is that a possibility of forming some to kind of research some things? I personally have some time on my hands. So I'm curious about some things. I mean, I don't know much about zoning. I can you know look into that, but also kind of having like a, more or less an in-house developer versus all those different, you know, developers. We use a lot of developers. Why can't Amherst employ one? Nate, do you want to say, so? I, uh, I think that we would, it would be less competitive then because it would be one developer that was always the same developer the town would have to think of something to do with the developer as employees when there was nothing at the moment to develop. Well, um, we always and have so something to develop. I mean, sorry. <laughs> oh, well, that's that's my I mean, Nate may have. I don't think the town wants to do that at all. But maybe yeah. Nate has more to say that than I just said. Well, I think it's also a matter of efficiency. Um, and yeah. so, I mean, from my experience, just being on the trust is that you have nonprofit and you may have for profit too, but we're using nonprofit. It seems like we're using nonprofit developers and it is a huge amount of work from what I have seen just um, from the Northampton road. Um, the amount of people uh, 
hours around thinking through the planning and getting it all through, that's a lot, a lot of work. And the efficiencies might not be there when you have, you know, a non-for-profit um, organization that does this type of work, that works with the state, that knows how to work with DHCD. There's a lot more efficiencies in that than a, a town having um, someone on hand, and they may not be able to actually juggle multiple projects either. They may only do be able to do one versus a nonprofit organization that that's their focus, and they're able to uh, be more efficient because they have all that expertise, and they have a whole staff with different type of expertise that jumps in uh, for the different pieces, and, and it's absolutely a complicated process. But yeah, I was going to speak to that. We could talk about that Marita. later, but um, yeah, no, subcommittees, so, you know, um, what Erica said about the open meeting law is that, you know, like a sub quorum. So for instance, if two members are talking and, you know, go out and meet and have some, talk about something, that's not a violation of open meeting law uh, necessarily. And, you know, like I said, if it's just between two members, um, but if there's a subcommittee of two members where, you know, there's a subcommittee on studying, um, you know, homelessness, or there's a subcommittee on studying something, then those subcommittee meetings, even if it's only two members, you know, there has to be a posted meeting, you have to take minutes. So the trust had uh, three subcommittees um, a few years ago. And so there was, you know, things that they were looking at and it's, they've somewhat, um, you know, they, they were never officially, um, I don't, I, mean, I don't wanna say like ended or terms were ended, but, you know, we could reconstitute a subcommittee or two for specific topics. And then, you know, we could post the meetings and you can meet uh, in person or over Zoom and, you know, but they would have to follow the open meeting law as well. So, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't want trust members to, you know, if you have questions, always ask myself, right? You can reach out to me. And if I don't know the answer, I can find, find out. So if you do have questions about open meeting law or other things, you know, I don't want to discourage trust members from asking questions or, or talking about, you know, this with other, other members or other people. So, um, and we are going to talk about subcommittees actually number six. I so think Rita had her hand up. Yeah, Welcome, I just Rita. wanted to, I, um, sorry, I had another meeting. Um, I just wanted to address what Ashley had asked about, about, you know, having sort of an in-house in municipal developer. And in fact, you know, the Amherst Housing Authority is the closest thing to that. So the Amherst Housing Authority is a, you know, it's a public entity um, they do development, they don't do, they typically, you know, have focused on um, public housing development and administering um, rental subsidies. Um, but, you know, there are instances where um, housing authorities have, you know, done, done development too. The reason why they typically don't do it. Well, there are two reasons. You know, the first is if you're a municipal entity like a housing authority or a town or a city, um, everything you do has to do through public construction. And um, anybody who's familiar with public construction versus doing something privately understands that it's both more complex and more expensive. And so everything from filed sub bids to um, prevailing wage rates, any time, uh, you know, a public entity does anything in that, you know, whether it's road construction, whatever, it, you know, it gets, it's much more complex. We think it's complex when a nonprofit does it, but if you add on a public entity. So, um, so not only is it, is it the public construction part of it that's a problem, but, you know, I think as, as has been pointed out by um, Erica and, and Carol, Two is um, there's typically not the level of expertise um, of development that you find in you know say a nonprofit or a for-profit developer that has a whole team and to, you know try to have a whole team of people um, employed by a housing authority or employed by a municipality just doesn't make sense unless you were gearing up to have to develop a huge number of units it just doesn't. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So that's why it's it's done the way it is done. But occasionally, you know, you will find housing authorities. Um, and in one case, I know a municipality or trust that tried to do de <laughs> development itself. And they, when I talked to them afterwards, they said, never again. <laughs> 
<laughs> never again. They realized how, um, you know, how it cost so much more and how that, that they just were not, they're just not in the business of doing development. So I hope that answers your question So. Yeah, I mean, so public housing is like when basically the city or the state owns the housing outright. And if you're making like a thousand units, it tends to be a little bit more useful to have it be owned by the state, would you say? But like we have like 70 units or something or 12, you know? So is that is it kind of more useful to have a nonprofit when there's kind of a smaller amount of units? It's, it's both the number of units, but it's also the type of units. So when, you know, public housing, um, the funding comes from, on well, Massachusetts, the funding typically comes from the state. And it's specific, it's a very specific um, population. And there hasn't been new construction funding for public housing. There has been for modernization, but not for new construction in decades. Um, so it, the, the state got out of the business of doing um, a lot of public housing construction and guided it towards um, kind of joint ventures because it was, you know, it was in a, inefficient and incredibly expensive. Okay. So, oh, me. Um, I had a question about sort of how this plays out on social media, and I know we had a conversation about that. But the the question I have is personal social media. I am not currently, I don't think, connected to other trust members. But for instance, if I, you know, shared a housing report or a housing article, and another member commented on it and a third member you know, a, a, like do we risk in i feel like some of these uh laws might not be in speed with that kind of where it's public in theory but we haven't invited anyone to witness a conversation so do we need to be careful about seeing each other's or commenting on each other's social media stuff I believe. I would say. Yep. Go ahead, Nate. Yeah, I would say to be safe, yes. Um, you know, the the caveat, right, or the condition is that it's under trust jurisdiction, and so, you know, um, someone could make the case that well, the trust deals with housing, so anything under housing is trust jurisdiction. Sometimes it's really, you know, it's more narrow. For instance, like if the zoning board of appeals deals with certain cases, it's like you know case specific or something, but. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that in some instances it's fine and some it may not be. And so that's a hard call to make and just say no or yes. The, you know, when I said there's a, you know, serial conversations could be a violation, you know, in your example, it's like, well, what if a conversation starts and one trust member, you have like, you know, a few comments back and forth and then a third member. And then really it's something that the trust might, um, might end up uh, recommending, say there's an article about zoning reform and someone's like, oh, this is really interesting. I really like this idea. And then you know, a week later, someone else puts a comment in and then, it, you know, all of a sudden that is a conversation that, you know, could violate the open meeting law because the trust really can recommend zoning, um, zoning changes. So, you know, but if there's something different, I mean, it's just, I feel like it's a case by case, but, um, you know, maybe to be careful, I would say just, you know, not to try, you know, I think having one comment or one, you know, some, something's fine, but once, you know, once the there's a back and forth conversation that becomes the, could become the, you know, something that's a violating open meeting law. Sorry, we couldn't be more helpful in terms of an exact answer. <laughs> well, I think, you know, uh, Nate, what you're saying, if you're in doubt, um, you may want to just say comment wise, let's bring this to the trust agenda, to the trust meeting and, and have a conversation about it. Great article, yeah. let's bring it to the trust meeting. There is, um, you know, the state will put out guidance documents and there's like a hotline of the day for ethics commission. Um, I think it might also deal with open meeting law and conflict of interest. So, 
you know, you kind of get lawyer of the day, but there is a 1-800 number you could call and you could, you know, you could pose a question. They'd only answer the person who's calling. So you couldn't call for someone else. Um, but so to your point, Risha, if you did have a question, you could call this lawyer of the day through the state and ask and just say, oh, you know, what's the, you know, is there, you know, you know, I post things on social, you could, you have to say it's for you, right? They don't, like I was saying, they don't answer for someone else. Right. So I couldn't call on the trust behalf. It'd have to be something uh, relevant to just myself, but you could ask, you know, if you have an example, but um, yeah. <laughs> Just found an article that um, a Mass Municipal Association did on this very question. So um, if you just Google it, if you do, so, so it's a long article, so I, I can't give you the answer right away, but um, it's addressed there and they, um, yeah, it goes on and on. <laughs> What's the name so, of the article? So what would, what would we Google to find it? Um, well, it's, it's, um, it's on MMA.org. And then the article is Social Media, Public Records, and the Open Meeting Law. What's that? So I just, so it was written by, I think it's somebody from KP Law. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's, an, it's an attorney, Richard Holland at KP Law, which is the yeah. firm the town uses, right? Yeah, I know. Right. Thanks, Rita. Okay. I'll, I'll, um, can I, I'll send it to you, uh, Nate. I'll send you the link and then maybe you can send it out. Thank you. Yeah. And MMA is the Mass Municipal Association. Association. So can we move on? We should like to be able to uh, talk about the September housing forum coming up. And in order to do that, can we invite yeah, John left. Did John leave? No, there he is. Yay. Invite John and maybe Michelle to come into the room. John is kind of running at least a lot, a part of this for us still. It's so good to see you again, John. Hi. Michelle, I'll be a panelist if you want. You can decline, but if you'd like, you could join as a panelist too. I think I a lot asked her too. Okay, yeah, so she, Michelle will just stay in, as a participant if needed, she can raise her hand. Um, okay. So John, you gotta unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, Michelle knows much of what I'm about to say, but not necessarily everything because I, there are various parties that are involved in this. So I'll begin first of all, by saying that we have a date confirmed, and that is Tuesday, September 13th, to begin at 6.30 p.m. Um, a couple of people probably need to be present earlier to set up because the location for the in-person meeting is going to be the social hall at the Unitarian Universalist Society. So that's confirmed by them. Um, in addition, I've put in a request to Amherst Media to arrange for some kind of both recording and online access to the meeting, and uh, they'll probably get to work on that oh, probably in a couple of weeks or whatever. The reason they're not doing it immediately is people may be aware they've just moved to temporary quarters. There also been some staffing turnover. So while the uh, director, Jim Lesko, has acknowledged my requests and said they'll, they'll definitely get to it and they appreciated the long lead time, uh, they're not quite ready to uh, work with us yes, but yet. But and anyway, I anticipate that they'll definitely be uh, do recording and then we'll see what we work at with respect to online access. Um, what I imagine the speakers would be were, first we would lead off to talk about current and planned affordable housing development in Amherst. Um, and that would be our new co-chairs, Carol and Erica. So this would be 
uh, their opportunity to the extent they aren't already known in the community to be introduced more broadly. Um, and then that would be followed by what is really the main agenda for the meeting, which is planning to date for the East Street, Belchertown Road affordable housing development. And that would all be led by Wayfinders. I'm not quite sure what Michelle's role will be, but I expect that um, Keith Ferry, who's the president and CEO, and also an Amherst resident, um, will lead off. I think as uh, we had a presentation from her that Diane Smith, who's the vice president for real estate development, would also be participating. Um, Michelle is uh, uh, expecting that the architect for the East Street Belchertown Road development would make a presentation and she can contradict me if I'm not right on this. I'm also assuming that uh, a member of Wayfinders staff that does building management and resident support would also be on hand to talk about those elements of the project. So that's really what the evening would be. My guess is it would be uh, at least 90 minutes and depending on questions and how long the speakers go on, it could be up to two hours. So it would be starting at 6.30 and ending sometime between 8 and 8.30. Uh, the next piece of planning, which we've talked a little bit about, is outreach. Um, in collaboration with Wayfinders, we will develop a poster for distribution um, both through email and also to be posted in various places. Um, I would use my current uh, list of 20 to 25 local organizations and request that they publicize the forum and that's worked pretty well in the past to their membership. Um, we'd also do announcements to uh, people in the neighborhood so that they're aware of the forum and they uh, have the opportunity to observe or participate as they wish. And finally, I think Risha had suggested to this that we also do announcements to the Fort River community. So that's my list for outreach and that's my description of what I anticipate we're doing. Um, so this is a good opportunity to say, oh, you missed this, or to raise questions um, where I have uh, not been clear about something. So, Erica. Um, thank you. Um, John, thank you. It's so wonderful to see you. Um, this is exciting, very, very exciting. Um, it sounds to me that we need some help uh, with setting up. Uh, so we may need some members to come at six o'clock and set up and then at 830, if it goes till 830 to help clean up. I mean, I've been to forums before and everyone is actually wonderful. Everybody just, you know, takes chairs and, and cleans and, and gets everything ready, but it might be better for us to have a few volunteers. And it sounds to me that um, the outreach, I'm, I'm not really clear about the Fort River community outreach. Are we talking about knocking on doors? Are we talking about um, just having it in like the Amherst Bulletin. Um, what are we talking about in terms of outreach to the Fort River community because they're the ones who are the closest to the project? Um, I think I'd go to the superintendent, to Mike Morris and ask him what the best way is to reach that community. Cause we'll probably be, we can do it obviously when the school year begins. But I think one of the things that Risha emphasized is that we need to uh, find a way of, uh, uh, of doing it in advance so that there's a reasonably long lead time um, in which people can learn about this. I don't know if any research or anybody else has any specific suggestions about this. Um, so I think I mentioned last time that that date is a conflict for me, so I won't be able to attend, um, but I would like to help 
sort of design the marketing, if that's something that I can help with as that is the thing I do? Sure. Um, I'd be glad to have your collaboration. Um, so you and I should talk about that um, yeah. probably offline. And I can describe typically what I've done. And you can talk about what we should plan to do to augment that. And it, it might just be the posters and stuff. If, if I don't, yeah, know. I'm, I'm just going to say, John. I, you know, I just made a note to myself to confirm. You know, as a trust meeting, what do we need to do? Um, you know, if it's in person or not, or if that's allowable in August so, or September. So, um, anyways, you know, I'll get. I'll hopefully can get an answer soon. I was just thinking about that. Um, you know, the state will, you know, we'll know soon what the state says, but, um, you know, for instance, the town may still want every, everyone to be remote or if it's in person, you know, how do we broadcast it live if that's what they want? So, um, you know, uh, you know, hybrid meetings work that way in that, you know, there's a Zoom link and it's still, people are still attending and seeing everything through Zoom. And then, but, you know, the trust would still, um, you know, can interact with people in the room and over, online but at uu i'm not sure if we'd have that capability and so you know i just want to make sure that we can have something at the uu and still you know meet whatever whatever you know meeting guide guidance we need to yeah i i don't know the answer to your questions i mean i've also thought that it's possible that at the end of the day the town manager would say we're still not doing in-person meetings, so this has to be over Zoom. But for the moment, I think it's best if we not wait for that decision, but to plan ahead. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, you know, related to what we can do as a practical matter with respect to allowing online access, I was hoping that Amherst Media could help to solve that problem for us. And that's why I initiated a request to uh, Jim Lesko. Uh, so I'll find out more when he's available or somebody else at Amherst Media is available to talk about planning. And, you know, you can be involved in that as well, Nate. Yeah, I mean, I know Amherst Media right now and the trust or when the planning board and other boards meet, they actually just, they actually take the Zoom recording after the fact and use it. And so they They've been relying on the Zoom to help broadcast it live, um, you know. So they do it themselves too, but you know they really are taking advantage of Zoom as well. So I don't, you know, if it's in a space where they would have to, um, you know, record it like they used to, they probably can. Just you know, we have to make sure that that's allowable. Yeah, I mean, in the past when we've done meetings in the social hall at the UU, um, somebody from Amherst Media has been there. Right. Uh, actually recording the event, but right. it hasn't been simulcast, which is probably what we're looking for here. So I'm not technically savvy enough to be able to, um, to know exactly how we can make that work. Yeah. This brings me to what may be an open meeting question again, but it seems like some of the organizing or the final details of logistical details and stuff about how this is going to work are going to happen behind the scenes and before the next meeting and offline. And so how do, is that all okay? I mean, this is just logistical stuff. It's not deliberation, except maybe about which form of remote access we use. That doesn't seem like a any violation of anything, but now that I'm thinking so much about open meeting laws, I want to know. No, that's all good. All right, that's good. So we so whatever needs to happen can happen so that the that's good. Yep. Yeah, and we may be able to report on publicly, well we should be able to report publicly on whatever progress we've made um at your August meeting, Carol. Yeah, um, we have that. So I, I I don't I don't think that open meeting is an issue. Great. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, Michelle's in the audience. I think, you know, the town too would also want to talk to wayfinders about what, you know, how, what, what is presented and how information is, 
or comments I received because although they're the developer, it is town property. So, you know, it's a, it's a partnership project. And so um, I haven't, um, you know, I, I've let my supervisors know that this is happening, but as you know, from now that we know it is kind of a date certain, we'll, we can also see what, you know, how we'd want to present it or what, you know, what, where this is, um, you know, because wayfinders might use this as kind of starting of, uh, of permitting, right? So there's a process through the comprehensive permit or how they would use to go through the development. So this, you know, this actually becomes um, kind of like the first official um, public engagement for the project. And then, um, you know, we might want to have certain documentation of it and everything just to include in the, when information is passed on to the state. Yeah. Well, it sounds to me, Carol, you and I are not only um, going to lead off and um, provide a presentation where we are um, with um, our plans, but we'll probably also moderate uh, unless we were thinking of somebody else moderating the whole um, event. You want to moderate, John? Uh, no, actually, I'm. I'm assuming that someone from Wayfinders will okay. Uh, okay, be great. directing traffic uh, once they uh, they take over that part of the meeting. Okay. I mean, I, I can ask Michelle to confirm that, but I'd be surprised if that wasn't the case. I think that okay. they'll be clear about who's speaking and uh, about what in advance and who's taking questions and so forth. So we just have to start out and turn it over to them. Yes. Sounds good. And if you and Arisha decide what we really should do is go door to door in Fort River and put flyers in doorknobs, you guys can ask some of us to do that, right? And that's not any kind of a problem either. I don't know. I'm just like, no, I mean, I, and then let me know too. Um, you know, we can post up on the town's, um, you know, we'll need to post it as a trust meeting and then we can put it on. The town's website we can you know make a, a facebook post about it and a, an event and other things so you know if there is a flyer or information we can also distribute it and you know post it in different ways great uh, and you know we don't need you know we can post the agenda it only the agenda only needs to be posted two days in advance right but if the flyer is ready weeks in advance you know we can put it out on the community calendar and have information and everything ready so I mean, we could have a goal of like mid-August, you know, so a month from now having at, at the next meeting, things ready to be made public and, you know, posted on the town website and everything. Yeah, I would hope that we'd have a poster uh, and any more planning that we need to do related to outreach accomplished by the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Yeah, and I'll get an answer too about how we can structure the meeting in terms of in-person or um, remote. And we'll probably know, you know, tomorrow or early next week what, what the decisions made at the state level about meetings, so. Okay. okay. So it was made, it was made already, Nate. I just, I got an email. Oh, really? Yeah. Meetings. What yeah. was it? So they extended it to 2023. I learned that at my last meeting. Well, I thought so it was. Yeah. A, it was so extended. that means this can't be an in-person meeting. Is that what you understand, Rita? I I don't know what the rules are. It's just extending the um, the remote meeting ability. So I think people are holding in-person meetings. It's a waiver, but it's a waiver. Okay. Right? Because we're it's, supposed to have in-person meetings, so it, we can. It's a waiver to we can decide not to. Yeah. I'll try right. some guidance. Okay. So then the next issue would be, what does the board of health and the town manager say? And that could change in a month or two. Uh, yep since we don't know exactly what the spread of COVID is going to be. Okay, well, it sounds like we're going with John's suggestion, which is plan for it to be in person with a fallback that we hope we don't have to use of maybe it won't be. <clears throat> and uh, that makes sense to me. Does anybody disagree or anything with that? Okay. 
Well, then I think it's Erica who's going to go through some of this part that we call trust priorities and roles and subcommittees. Go, Erica. Thank you very much. So thank you again, Nate, for uh, sending out the strategic plan. And I hope people notice that it said from 2018 to 2022. Um, tw this is 2022. So um, we have to start thinking about our next five years. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the overarching goals for 2020 to 2022, um, which is our, there on page four. And I think it's a good lead into some of the conversation that Ashley brought up. Um, but I think it's good to remember um, what these goals were for this for the past two years or the, this year and the, and the year before. Foster development of second town owned property, which we've been doing. Um, and I think we're already on our third and we're looking towards possibly Hickory Ridge and other places as well. Foster strong communication and integration of efforts among the various housing entities active in Amherst. Uh, Allegra, you've been sort of exemplary in that. And Rob, I think you're, you're also crossing some of those organizations. And John has absolutely been exemplary in, in making those connections. Explore establishing new or expanding existing rental and home ownership housing assistant programs. Research how to improve access to existing programs. Um, we had tried to start doing some of that before COVID. We had actually a subcommittee looking at that. And now we also have the navigator, um, you know, and thinking about um, how to expand rental, uh, affordable rental properties and home ownership we've been talking about uh, for a while. Uh, support and develop programmatic legislative and policy housing initiatives to mitigate the effects of the pandemic disasters on low and moderate income households and the emergency rental uh, assistance was uh, one initiative in doing that. Explore new and existing revenue sources, including institutional sources, with the goal of ensuring that the trust is in a strong financial position for the next five years. Review the town's zoning bylaws and work with the town departments and planning board to affect updating of these bylaws. Explore opportunities for conservation-based development with town departments. So those were sort of the priorities for 2020 to 2022. And we've acted on a lot of them, but there's also other opportunities. And the reason why I wanted to sort of highlight that, uh, along with the whole strategic plan, I hope that you've had an opportunity to read it. Um, there's a lot of excellent information there. And um, I got, you know, I read it when I first joined the trust to also get some of the history and understand the, the structure of how the trust works with the CPA uh, and how we get our funding and um, what our purpose is uh, and what our plans are and what our, our aspirations are. Um, and that's really important in terms of of a housing trust um, member. Um, but it also gives us a sort of a blueprint of opportunities to get involved if uh, you're not co-chairing um, uh, or even as co-chairs um, to get involved um, to support some of the goals that we have in the housing trust for the housing trust. So, um, you know, as, you know, Ashley mentioned, you know, there, there are there are many ways of supporting um, some of these goals, such as being the liaison. Um, Will, when he first, when he was with us, he was our liaison to information around state legislat uh, legislation uh, or finding out what CHAPA was doing uh, because they keep their fingers on the pulse of legislation that impacts affordable housing um, and other organizations. So thinking about, you know, would you want to be um, doing that and bringing information back to us, recommendations to the trust about supporting uh, legislation. Um, for example, uh, the legislation that uh, Carol mentioned, um, the, there's actually a House Bill 1377 and Senate 868, which talks about the transfer fee of sales um, and those fees going to the possibility of uh, those fees going to affordable housing um, in in supporting affordable housing trusts. Um, so that's really, really important to think about all the legislation that's out there that we may not know about because not all of us have the time, but if one person or a couple of people wanted to keep track of that and be our sort of person to bring back anything that is applicable to what our goals are and things that we might want to support, write a letter of support or find out more information about, um, you could actually take that role on and to ensure that we're always attuned to what's happening and that we maximize our efforts with other organizations to ensure that if there are opportunities to support affordable housing, um, that, that we're actually doing that. Um, there was also um, a suggestion to increase our presence through social media. And that really requires someone to be interested in first 
finding out what are the different channels that we could think about um, posting in social media articles or um, information on data, data uh, with regards to affordable housing initiatives, uh, the lack of affordable housing in, um, in Amherst, trends that are happening in Amherst, and the need to support affordable uh, housing, and the different ways that individuals or community organizations can support the development of affordable housing, either rental properties or home ownership. Um, so there's absolute opportunities for someone to take that on um, and think about um, really getting our uh, goals out there and um, also the work that we're doing um, as the trust or with other organizations. And then um, the last piece, if you look at page 21, and um, we actually talk about um, subcommittees. And as Nate said, that they, there have been subcommittees in the past. Um, and so we can form subcommittees specifically to uh, enhance some of the goals that we have uh, and some of the priorities that we have. So we wanted to put that out there. Uh, and then one last piece in the uh, strate strategic plan, um, uh, Carol actually noticed this and, and wanted uh, to underline it on page 21, is that we actually wrote that we would review the strategic plan annually, evaluate what we have done and actually celebrate our successes. Um, and then also see how much more that we need to do and create an action plan of that. So. Um, that's that would be a great subcommittee to take that on um, to take a look at the strategic plan. Think about you know um, how we can start as a trust, make a recommendation as a trust to think about how we're going to evaluate that, um, how we're going to actually set up writing a new strategic plan, and so um, that would be definitely a, a great opportunity for a couple of members to create a subcommittee to do that and then bring that back. I think it's too difficult for nine members of a housing trust to be working on a strategic plan every every time we meet. That's all we would be doing. But a subcommittee could actually take that on, um, review it, come back with suggestions. Uh, and then present it. So um, we really want you to think about how could you um, take on some of these areas. Um, if you want to start a subcommittee, bringing it to the trust and say, you know, maybe we need a subcommittee on social media, on social media presence. Um, and maybe we need a subcommittee on the um, starting to develop a strategic plan. But we'd really want you to think about um, how you are going to um, connect, you know, the goals that we have and the goals that you have on being on the housing trust and thinking about um, you know, stepping up to, to, to doing um, and supporting those goals. So I just wanna open that up and see if there are any ideas. Well, um, I just, because I just heard this on NPR, actually, you know, there's a gonna eventually, this is not until like November, there's a ballot measure, measure that will be a 4% tax on everyone that makes more than two, $2 million a year has anybody heard of that? And so I think that's a wonderful idea, but then that's a lot of money coming into the state, I assume. And I guess it's not, because I have not researched these things and maybe some people can tell me, how are we getting, like, how are we getting taxes? That's gonna be a lot of money. I think that would be wonderful to have for affordable housing in Western Mass. How do we know, well, it has to pass, but then also there's cannabis taxes and that has to be, um, I think they're kind of like reworking the cannabis tax. I don't know if it's gonna go up or not. And then also there's the property or real estate tax. How can we get more money from the state or whoever? And then how can we put that into, I kind of like the idea of like bigger is better public housing or affordable housing in general. So that sounds like, to me, um, it could be a subcommittee to explore new and existing revenue sources. Um, you could focus a subcommittee, you know, if you or if you wanted to take that on and, and lead that yourself, um, to to really look at, you know, what are the opportunities out there to increase, you know, revenue sources for the trust that then we could utilize for affordable housing. Yeah, I, I'm definitely interested, and then also more. I guess, diverse housing, like tiny houses or mobile home parks or things that aren't just apartments. It sounds like it's very focused on apartments and every once in a while a house, but a, a whole house is very expensive, obviously. What if there was like quite a bit more diverse kind of affordable housing? We actually did have a presentation on, um 
someone's gonna have to help me with this. Um, we, we were looking at, uh, if there's a specific name for small houses. Um, Accessory yeah, dwelling old, units. That's what it was. We had a presentation on that, but the, which is separate from the, the, the tiny homes. Um, yes, we actually did have a presentation on that. Um, How'd but it I go? Think, I mean, did you like it? <laughs> the, well, yeah, the, so the, the, the town, yeah, the town did pass a bylaw last fall uh, to allow accessory <laughs> dwelling units, you know, up to a thousand square feet. Bit, bit, you know, almost by right. If they're bigger, they need some other uh, permitting mechanism. But I think, Ashley, to your second point about housing types, I mean, I do think that you know that could be a subcommittee that focuses on. Um, you know, just that, like, you know, other, you know, zoning mechanisms or other just, you know, ways to incentivize different types of housing and affordable housing. And so, you know, I mentioned in announcements that the uh, community resource committee might be looking at that too. So I do think that, um, you know, some of them might be, you know, a subcommittee just looks at what are existing documents the town has, and then what, where do we think there could be opportunities and, you know, whether it's, you know, allowing, trying to encourage smaller units or like you said, different kinds of units. Um, and it, you know, I think people have that idea and then the, it's really then how do you implement it and what, you know, what does that mean? And, you know, is it a zoning measure? Is it funding to incentivize a development? Um, you know, often the development we see, um, you know, the affordable housing we see being developed is because that's what the state programs fund, right? There's a priorities that may change every so many years, but that's kind of where the funding is. And so if the town's like, we'd love to see a tiny house development, right? Say like 300 square foot homes, like 10 of them on a property, uh, that might just end up being a locally funded project because there's really not other funding out there. There might be, but you know, that for that, and it, for instance, that's something that may actually be really workable uh, in terms of housing, but it's maybe the funding isn't there. So I do think that that becomes a pretty big project or something that a subcommittee could research and, you know, come up with ideas and um, talk about them. It's also somewhat relevant because the town adopted a comprehensive housing policy last year with, you know, like a hundred strategies on how to implement it. And they're kind of going through it too, to determine, you know, where, where, where does the town, you know, in terms of town council or staff time or others, where do the resources, where, where do you focus on? So, um, you know, I think what, you know, the financing and housing types are some, you know, pretty important topics to continue looking at. Others or anybody who wants to join any of these, uh, I think these two are, I think, really important. Don't all speak at once. <laughs> but if you don't want to, if you don't want to say something right now, <clears throat> please think about what you might want to do and and you know email us in between and or whatever because to get to get somewhere you don't have to answer right this minute. And um, really, Carol and I will plan on thinking about uh, having a time to evaluate, uh, and we're still in twenty twenty. Um, but, you know, it's never too early to plan something for the future uh, and thinking about, you know, evaluating our strategic plan and thinking about steps possibly to um, updating our strategic plan. I know, uh, Nate, it looks like we had a consulting firm or someone else um, do the report. Right. Yeah, so the last thing we, we could hire someone else again, or we, you know, we had kind of updated it, you know, somewhat recently with those action steps. And so it's, um, you know, however the trust wants to move forward. Um, I will say that there is a, a rehousing and homelessness, uh, I think it's task force, Allegra's on it and I'm staffing it. <laughs> I need to do more staffing of it, but the, um, the idea was to have an assessment of existing services in town, um, both for, you know, um, you know, shelter and for day services and other services and then where are their gaps and what are recommendations and the report was started and never finished. And so uh, I think in May, the, the group, you know, we discussed writing like a summary memo or a more concise memo in the next so many months, say by the end of the year, but really trying to determine, you know, what, you know, what is the, what opportunities are there for the town to help 
um, with, you know, homelessness or sheltering and, you know, or, or you know, extremely low income. And so um, that is something that, you know, there's a separate group that's working on it and the trust could be, you know, apprised of that in terms of, you know, at some point as material gets developed, you know, it could be presented to the trust for, um, for the trust opinions and recommendations. And then maybe it becomes a subcommittee of the trust or, you know, I don't know what happens, but this is, this group is really focusing on it. Uh, it's a, it's a good group. In Allegra, you're on that group? Uh, yes, I am. Um, and I guess one thing that just kind of popped into my head, and I think we might have talked about that in this group, but it might be helpful to see about looping Earl Miller in um, the new director of the Crest mm. program, because I think he has done a lot of boots on the ground just trying to meet a lot of people in both the service community and just the community at large. Um, and he, I think we had discussed that as a possibility in our last group, but I do think that would be an important stakeholder to yeah. engage. Yeah, he's the you know, director of the Crest program. Actually, it's really funny. We were in a meeting and someone said, oh, what should we do with this? I'm like, oh, I'm like, I talked to Earl a few times, like, let's give it to Earl. <laughs> it's like, oh, he's the new guy. Let's put all the work on him. No, uh, I forgot what we were talking about. But, um, <laughs> He's a really good guy. So yeah, I think that's a really good point, Allegra. He's he's done a lot already out in the community, and um, so. Can I just ask you something, Allegra? Um, just in terms of like homelessness and um, like rehoming people, just curious, and because I I've worked with homelessness, do do what do people tend to want? Do they want permanent things they own, or do they want apartments? Do they want hotel rooms? Are they, do you have a sense of like the people that are homeless or you are, are in the transitioning to homes, what are they really looking for? I mean, I think anecdotally, I've heard from you know, people who've been working at Craig's stores that certainly the hotel room model of sheltering that we've kind of transitioned to during the pandemic has been much more favorable because it's more stable than say a congregate shelter where you have to go every night and get a number and stand in line and maybe you'll get a bed and maybe you won't. Um, but I think, you know, I think that people are experiencing the difficulty that everyone looking for housing is experiencing and that even if they have some way of making, a, you know, a housing opportunity more affordable, there aren't very many places in Amherst where like a mobile voucher will qualify at this point. Um, and I do think that, you know, hopefully with the Northampton Road apartments coming online, people will have the opportunity to get into a permanent apartment. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question, actually. I think, you know, we've heard in some of the models we looked at, you know, it's, you know, almost like studio apartments or smaller apartments, small one bedrooms. Um, and not necessarily, you know, they're, they're smaller, um, you know, the rentals, um, as opposed to say like a four bedroom where they're sharing space, you know, where there's, you know, like a roommate situation or a housemate situation. And so when, um, you know, there are different models for that, where some of it's, you know, transitional housing and some of it's permanent supportive housing. And there's, you know, I think some, there's opinions on what's better. I think in Amherst, you know, what we've lost over the years is kind of that single room occupancy, studio <coughs> housing, boarding housing, um, and different kind of uh, types of rental housing. And so, you know, a hundred years ago, there was probably, um, you know, options, different options of housing that's just not available now. And so we're, you know, I think, um, um, you know, I think like Allegra said, for a shelter, we're looking at having, you know, it still be a congregate shelter with multiple beds, <laughs> but during the pandemic, the use of hotel rooms was, was really great, right? Having people um, in, a, in a room. Um, and so I think though, it's like the cost of it and, you know, what, what happens um, after there isn't FEMA money to support it. So, you know, it's really nicely supported financially during the pandemic and that may or may not happen in the coming shelter season. But, you know, the town's looking at, you know, what, you know, what can we do to support a shelter um, and then, you know, I, I do think housing is a big, big piece, but we're also, you know, we're looking at probably small, um, rental 
rentals as opposed to you know some other model right now. Okay. So, um, oh, Risha? Just on the social media bit, I mean, it seems to me that if we have to have everything approved ahead of time, that that's pretty limiting for social media, which is by its nature a, a quicker response kind of, of thing. So um, while I would be happy to volunteer for it, I don't, given that, I don't think it makes sense to invest much in it. Sorry, well, I mean, are you talking about like just like having um, like, a, like a streaming blog or something where there's, I, I guess, what do you mean by approved? Um, well, my understanding is that if we wanted to post things on Twitter and share things from an official trust account that everyone would have to approve all of those um, and that the timeliness of that would then sort of defeat the purpose of those kinds of, of communication channels. Yeah, unless we unless when we read the long thing that Rita has asked us to go find, unless we find some other some other suggestion in that that suggests there's some way around it, then it sounds like I agree with you. <laughs> I mean, I do think you know the town has a web page and different uh, media platforms we can post on. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the. However, I do think you know if the trust has a you know. A, a page that is updated monthly. I know it's not as frequent as it could be. I mean, it is still, it could still be useful, um, but it wouldn't be as dynamic as, you know, what maybe what, you know, some people are thinking, right? So it is somewhat static, but it is still useful to put information out there. And so it just might be, you know, I'm not sure how many people actually go to the, you know, the town government website to look for information on housing. But if, you know, if they Google, can't find it. Housing Amherst or something, and somehow we tag the housing trust in a way that that becomes, you know, part of a you know a results of search. Then maybe it is still important, even though it's not as interactive as you'd like. Uh, but it sounds like that would be better than what we have now in terms of we don't even, particularly on the Amherst town website, we don't have like a little bar or anything that says upcoming housing, affordable housing, you know, bulletin. Do we? I haven't seen it, <laughs> but. You haven't found it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wasn't looking very hard apparently, but it would be nice to just have a little box that was like red that said Amherst affordable housing is here for you or something. You know, it's like we can advertise ourselves somewhere. Ideally, <laughs> you know. That could happen if somebody wanted to try to figure it out and connect it to the town. I mean, yeah. I don't know who runs a town website. So far, it seemed to me like finding minutes on it has been fairly <laughs> far after the fact. Um, but I don't know. So if somebody wants to look into all of this, they could or not. Well, who runs the town website? Yeah, so, you know, IT in general, and then we have our, um, you know, communication officers, but then, you know, since I staff the trust, I'm, you know, technically responsible for maintaining everything that would go up through the trust webpage. Um, and I, I can say that I don't um, do that very often. You know, we did have the administrative position, you know, John Page had been doing it and he was doing a pretty good job a, a few years ago and then we had someone else um, and now we've run into some, some roadblocks about how to hire someone to do that. But, uh, you know, someone on the trust, I guess, if you're interested, you can, you know, we, they could get access to, to the, to that web, you know, the web pages and help keep that up to date on the town website. So it doesn't necessarily have to be me. We just have to, um, you know, if there's someone who would be willing to do it, um, that's possible. So maybe if somebody decides they want to take that on, they could let, especially Nate, know, and, and Erica and I, be, be, whenever it is that you decide that you want to do that, and we can go from there. I would like to not, I mean, I'd like to manage to have time to do these, the updates that we have on our projects, especially uh, East Gable, since I see that 
Laura is even an attendee and might want to give it herself. I asked her and I have a little blurb that she sent me an email, but Laura, if you're there, do you want to, is that why you're here? Or do you want to, do you want to give us an update? You can raise your hand, Laura, if you want to speak. There she goes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello. Um, I would love to give an update. So um, for those of you who are daring enough to go down Northampton Road these days, um, you'll see that everything's under construction. <laughs> um, and the project at 132 Northampton Road is going along actually surprisingly well, given all the challenges in the supply chain and construction environment. So I encourage people to take a look if you can. Um, it looks like we're building like a big styrofoam cooler um, because there's so much insulation. This is a passive house um, certified building. It's the first one that Valley has undertaken. I think it'll be one of the first multifamily um, passive house developments in Western Massachusetts. Um, and so it's a little bit unique in the construction methods, um, but the clearing is done, the old house is gone, the foundation is in, they're doing um, the mechanical systems that are gonna run under the slab floor. Um, and they should probably be pouring the slab in another week or two. So it's, it's pretty good progress. Um, so we're very pleased with it. Um, we are looking at a completion date in July of 2023. It still feels like it's a long way away, but it, it'll come fast, um, which means we'll be looking at marketing uh, kind of toward the very end of this year, starting to market, looking at a lottery sometime in the spring. You know, now that the building is being built, I do get inquiries once in a while. Um, we don't have an application yet, but if people want to email me, I'm at least starting a, a list, a notification list. So, and, and I do, I have been getting inquiries coming in. Um, so I, I know people are out there. So send them my way. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure they know when it's time to apply um, for the project. Do you want me to give a one minute what it is for folks who might be new? Sure. So it's a twi it's called East Gables. It's, it's right next to the Amherst College uh, Fieldhouse. Uh, it is a 28 unit, um, basically all small studio apartments. They're self-contained units that have a kitchen and each one has a kitchen and a bathroom. Um, 10 of them have a priority for folks, individuals that are homeless. Two of them are reserved for clients of the Department of Mental Health. And then the other units range uh, in terms of income limits, but everything is less than 80% of the area median income. So we have 30%. 60%, 80% units there. Um, we will have a resident services coordinator, kind of a three quarter position on site, property management on site. There's some common areas um, also in the building. So that's kind of the skinny on it. Um, there is actually, I think, still a ton of information on the town's website about this project. Right, Nate? It never went away, did it? It never went away. So if you want to know everything, it's there. You, every letter ever written. <laughs> The hundred letters, <laughs> a whole server all for itself. <laughs> no. um, so, and if I can grab your attention for un one more minute, we have another project in planning in Amherst that we're starting to get ready to let people know about. Um, we will be acquiring uh, an eight acre parcel uh, on 20 to 40 Ball Lane Road in North Amherst. Uh, it's Save. a middle district. What? I, I'm sorry, I missed that. Could you say the address once more? 20 through 40, Ball Lane. Uh, it's the corner of, it actually has a bunch of corners. It's the corner of Pulpit Hill, uh, Montague Road, and Ball Lane. Everybody looks confused. Nate will show you a map. <laughs> Eventually. That's okay, go ahead. Um, there was a trucking company there. It's been for sale for a long time. Um, uh, within the last year, the kind of um, industrial warehouse style buildings that were on site were demolished. 
Um, the co-housing folks on Pulpit Hill looked at this site for years um, and couldn't quite come to terms uh, with the sellers. Um, Valley uh, has an option to purchase. We have the financing in hand and we're just really kind of rolling along toward a closing date uh, in August. And we just sent a flyer out to the abutters. So we'll be having our first neighborhood meeting coming up in a few weeks. Um, it'll be a Zoom meeting, and then we'll follow that with a meeting on site probably once we've acquired the property um, in sometime in August. Uh, there is a single family house on the property that has a tenant who's probably going to remain there. Um, our proposal for this uh, pro property is approximately 30 uh, first time home buyer condos. Um, probably in duplexes. So it would be 15 buildings altogether. Um, we're looking at a lot at the way that co-housing is laid out. It's not co-housing per se, but we're looking at some of those kind of site planning um, priorities and, and also pocket neighborhoods. So we're gonna try to cluster the, the dwellings together, have a lot of open space remain on the property, um, have very high energy efficiency, all good things. Um, and so 20 of the 30 would be affordable. I think we're looking at 80% units, 100% units, and then 10 market rate units. Um, the reason we're able to do this miraculous thing is that the state has one funding program that's really targeting home ownership. Um, it's called the Commonwealth Builder Program. And if you go on to the Department of Housing and Community Development's website and you, you Google Commonwealth Builder Program, you can read about the intentions of the program, which are really to try to start to address underserved communities, particularly communities of color that have been kind of left out of, um, you know, building wealth through home ownership. So, and the reason we can do this in Amherst is strangely enough, North Amherst is a qualified census tract. So the census right. data in North Amherst is such that it is falling into a category. It's probably the only QCT in our region. <laughs> it's, you know, it, there, there just aren't many places that this is possible um, in Valley service area. So we're really excited about that. You'll be the envy of the neighboring towns who also want first time home buyer projects. Um, so anyway, we're really excited about it. We will be coming back to the trust to give you more detailed information. We certainly want your input um, as we go into the kind of planning and design part of the project. We always like to give neighbors first shot at knowing about a project. That's why I haven't really talked about this before, even though we've been working on this for a while. We want the neighborhood to hear about it first um, from us uh, before we start talking it around in, you know, public settings so that's coming that's great news laura that's exciting very exciting thank you so much sure yeah we're super excited about it great uh so let's see if i don't know is michelle still here michelle do you want to tell us anything about the progress with east street and belchertown road project or hand it up I'm unmuted. Yay. Can, can you <laughs> we can hear you. Okay. I have real problems with Zoom. Zoom doesn't usually. Um, so we're working with the town on the land development agreement. Um, we just received the second draft back from the town uh, and we will be reviewing it and getting it back to the town probably sometime by the end of next week, our second draft of their second draft. Uh, we are looking at possibly a reciting of the Belchertown Road property per the town. They um, request us to take a look at moving the building up to Belchertown Road. So we've, we are working on that. We have all of our civil in place, our environmental in place. And as soon as the LDA is signed, um, we're ready to go with the due diligence. Fantastic. Yep, and our attorney is on board and we're already looking, the town wants to do this as a local initiative program under the 40B. 
and we are already putting together all the documents that are going to be needed for the local initiative program, um, the application for that. Okay. Uh, anything else? <laughs> Nate, is this the place where the moving the house thing comes in? Or <laughs> something yeah. about moving a house. Michelle, are there any questions for Michelle before I end up changing the subject slightly? <clears throat> My only question was about moving the house. Okay. Because <laughs> yeah. I think Michelle said something about moving a house to Belchertown Road, and I wasn't sure if that meant like up the property to the side of the road from behind. No, so the um you know there's two houses on the Belchertown road properties there's the uh, brown older cape near the road and then there's one that's set back that's a modular house from the mid 90s and it's uh, uh the town in part of the the disposition of the property or the request for proposals was that the town would look at moving the houses and it's really not on wayfinders or you know um you know so we're looking at a town owned property. There's a few few of them. Um, of course, they all have wetlands on them. And I have some estimates to do wetland assessments and I just have to kind of get contracts going. Um, the town did just change its wetland regulations. I think it was like two weeks ago. So now that those are in place, we'll get contracts going. Um, you know, so, but the, the hope is to move maybe one of the houses um, and make a you know an affordable home ownership unit out of it. But you know, it would be relocated to a different town property, not closer right. to the road on the current. Right. Property. No, it would right. It'd be it'd be you know <laughs> it'd be taken off this property to a whole other property. Um, okay. yeah. What I talked okay. about. Um, what I was mentioning is the town had asked us to move the building that we designed closer oh, to right, right. Belcher Town Road. And because of the wetlands, that is, uh, you know, it's it, it, it's an issue, <laughs> and we're we're working through it right now. But there's a lot of wetlands on the Belchertown Road site too. Yeah. So the concept design that was submitted for the Belchertown Road site had parking. You know, it was the road, then parking, then the building, and we had said, you know, could you flip that or rearrange it so that the building faces the street in a way that it seems. You know, it creates a streetscape as opposed to um, perhaps more like a an office park um, look. But you know, there are site constraints that may limit how this you know how it can be designed and also achieve the number of units. So, can I ask a question about that? Because I feel like I remember part of the conversation being like it would create more of a village center feel. Um, but I have questions about like, if it's for families, it might be better farther away from the road because small children are really fast and they don't always make good choices. So maybe having like a little bit of a buffer and having property farther away from the road might not be the worst idea. Yeah. Just a thought. Yeah, so I would, Thank you. You know, yeah, I would hold those thoughts and then you know, this will go through permitting and the trust will probably have a chance to provide comments or you could individually as well. So, yeah. Great. Okay. Is there anything else on Belchertown Road or the moving of the house? No, no. I think, like Michelle said, we're trying to, you know, um, you know, and Laura even hinted right there, everything takes longer. So, you know, we're going through just discussions on all the legal documents and, you know, it's just the, the, the part that takes longer than you, you know, yeah, you know everything. Right, and then it's all the details that take a long time to get sorted out. So. Well, then that I think leaves us to two things that we were going to ask Nate about Strong Street again, and I think Hickory Ridge is, I don't know, anyway, either one of those two, Nate. Yeah, so uh, Strong Street, I, um, you know, we mentioned that there's some in, um, endangered species there. And so I filed a request with the state to get, um, uh, we had a pre construction meeting, we had a filing with Natural Heritage, and then um, I submitted a request for information from the state. And so when that's received, then we're going to have to hire um, a botanist or scientist to go out and actually do a field survey on the site. Um, and then after that, we can approach natural heritage again to see how much disturbance we can have on the property. So, uh, you know, it's just kind of, it's kind of waiting. I didn't want to hire someone until the state's responded in terms of what exactly we're looking for. So I submitted a request for information form 
um, about a month ago. So we should be hearing pretty soon. Uh, and then we'll have someone go out there. So I, you know, I'm still somewhat hopeful that that site could probably accommodate 10 to 14 units, you know, unless for instance, we find that the endangered species actually is wider spread than we think, and then it's not, but I'm hoping it's actually less than what the boundary shows and we could, you know, get maybe 16 or 20 units, but, um, you know, we'll wait to hear, you know, the building commissioner and I had come up with a way where the town might actually permit it as a, um, uh, almost like a condo development with a common drive and not a subdivision. And so uh, the permitting, you know, the from a land development and regulation standpoint, it's easier. Um, it's a little tricky, but we're trying to come up with a, some creative ways to get units in there. Um, so we're just kind of waiting on this, you know, this natural heritage piece. So that's still moving forward. It's just a little slower. Okay. Well, maybe we will, I will avoid, we will, unless Erica doesn't agree with me, avoid putting it on an agenda until you tell us you've got something. Sure. Because it seems like, I don't know. Just, yeah. We know you're working on it. We know it's slow. When something happens, we'd love to hear. <laughs> yeah. Just don't forget about it. That's why we keep it on there. So I. Yeah. You know. So we don't forget about it. I know right. that's. Yeah. And Hickory Ridge. Yeah. The. Um, yeah, I think something's going to happen pretty soon. You know, the um, the town owns it. Um, we just we just submitted a grant to put an accessible walking trail on the um, western portion. Um, but there's still, you know, five to ten acres, whatever. I don't, you know, could be four. But there's some amount of land that's developable, and so the town is going to engage in a process to determine what you know what kind of uses could go there. You know, we'll say that you know they're. There have been recommendations from you know a fire station to a community center to housing to just leaving an open space to an event venue and so a senior center so there's a number of um ideas for it and i think dave zomack and the planning department and some others will come up with a process uh this later this summer and fall but you know i think the trust we can just keep active um and you know be part of the conversation. Uh, you know, I think senior housing has been one that, you know, John and Rita looked at a while ago. And I, you know, I think there's still discussions about that, but, you know, the site is 150 acres. It's an old golf course, but, you know, 140 of those acres uh, is most of that now is either conservation or it floods or it's solar or there's restrictions on it. So there really isn't a lot of land that's left, um, even though it is a large parcel. But it is a will be a community amenity. So, you know, we are planning trails and other things. So, even if housing isn't what's built there, there's still going to be a process to determine, you know, what kind of community amenities are available on the other spaces. So, I think it's something that the trust can still be, you know, a part of. So, you know, we're trying to make trail connections into East Hadley Road, uh, and so the town's been working with property owners trying to determine how can we make a walking trail or trails that connect uh, north and into Pomeroy. Pomeroy Village Center so that there is access for neighbors and residents. Um, you know, we see it as a really good, good opportunity and an asset, um, even if it doesn't yield, you know, a lot of housing units, per, you know, for instance, but it's still a really good uh, thing for the town. And there is solar on it, right? So what happened is the developer, if people aren't familiar, you know, it's a, there's two high and dry sites behind the river uh, away from the road, but the developer, the previous owner, you know, applied for and um, had, you know, I forget how many acres of solar. So there's going to be two big solar installations on the property. Um, and then the remainder of it becomes available to the public, but, you know, there will be, you know, solar fields on it. And then there's some areas that will be restricted along the river that there isn't public access. So there's about 20 acres that need to be um, kind of left wild. And then they'll, you know, that's, I think that's probably about 50 acres that are Kind of off limits and then there's 100 acres that could be available for public use so will you keep our, it's at some point if there's a point at which we should get our our digs in and say yes we would like to see housing here which i assume is what we would be saying of some sort will you help us know when and where we should be doing that yeah and i think you know um and I, yeah, and we could even have it at the next uh, meeting or meet, you know, August or September, it could be a discussion about, um, you know, is it senior housing? So could the trust, you know, not just say housing in general, but if we think senior housing, 
or a certain type of housing and maybe spend a little bit of time talking about that. So when it's time for um, comment to the town, it could be a little more um, directed in terms of, you know, we think, you know, a mix of unit sizes for senior housing, right, or, or whatever, right, or family, you know, whatever there is, whatever, you know, more than just say, oh, we think it's good for housing, you know, is that we think, you know, 50 units of this type of housing or 60 units or, and we can pull up a map and look at a few things. But yeah, I mean, I think that's something in the next uh, one to three months we should kind of formulate. Sounds good. Um, does anybody have any comments about any of these projects that we've talked about before we move into our kind of end of meeting stuff? And I'll pass it back to Erica. Sure. Well, we want to open it up for public comments right now. So um, I cannot see hands. Nate, you can. Um, if there's anyone who has joined us who has a comment uh, or a question, um, this is the time. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's four attendees, and I think they've all spoken at some point. Not, so I'm not seeing any oh. hands being raised. Well, I want to thank the attendees, and I want to thank those especially who came and uh, presented. Um, so thank you. Um, and so we'll, then we'll close the public comment period, and we'll go to any items not anticipated within the 48 hours on this agenda. I don't think we have any, uh, and we have a couple of items that we said that we were going to present at the next meeting. Um, we're gonna have an update regarding the forum, um, the September 13th forum. And then another possible item is to think about more detail for presenting to the town um, what we think should happen with Hickory Ridge Road. Uh, and I think, you know, we have spoken a lot about senior housing and the need for senior housing. So. Um, we can open it up to ideas. So those two uh, agenda items, any other agenda items? We could have discussion of subcommittees, you know, if we think. Yep, thank you. We'll follow up on subcommittees. Anything else? And I can't see hands, sorry, I only see a few people at the same time. Looks like not. All right, um, so the upcoming meeting will be August 11th um, in August. And actually we do need a volunteer to do minutes. Would anybody like to volunteer to do minutes for August 11th? Um, George has been so kind to volunteer to do minutes will not be available. I can do it, but somebody remind me at the beginning of next meeting. Oh, I'll definitely. You got it. <laughs> Thank you so much. All Thank right. you very much. Yeah. Minutes. Perfect. Okay. Um, so then August 11th will be our next meeting and then September 8th, which will be right before our housing forum. Um, and thank you, Risha, for volunteering to work with uh, John around the marketing. And if there are other ideas about um, what uh, Carol mentioned in terms of house-to-house uh, -house marketing or, or talking to people or sending out flyers, we'll talk about that the next time. There you go. Um, George, George uh, sorry, I interrupt, has raised yeah. his hands. Thank you. George, you can unmute yourself. Very quick question. To whom should the minutes go? Should it go to the two co-chairs? Should it go to Nate? Who gets the minutes? Uh, the co-chairs are great. Good. we Will do. Thank you. Thanks, George. Thank you, George. All right. Before we end, any other comments, questions? Otherwise, I will move to end our meeting until August 11th. Thanks, Thank everyone. you so much, everybody. And please do not hesitate to send us agenda items. Yeah.